Let's start the second um, script. And we will talk about tectonic plasmatic tomographic signals of the Parion plates influence on Western North America. Okay. Okay, thanks to the organizers for um, putting together an interesting conference. And uh, Look forward to meeting some more more uh, people that are working on subduction dynamics. Happy to be uh, in an audience with a lot of people of common interests. So we're going to uh, shift over from Asia and look at North America. And so this is an uh, animation of the tectonic um, reconstruction from uh, the time here. Sorry, let's get the pointer going. That's this one. There we are, 40 down there and moving up. I'll show the animation again. And it, it's essentially showing the development of the Farallon plate breaking up and the birth of the San Andreas Fault um, and a, a continental transform fault developing. And in this part here, the, eventually the, the two parts of the subducted slab, you have a northern section and a southern section, they become separated enough to become two different um, subducting plates effectively. So there's a, a slab window in this area that develops and effectively separates the two. So I'll just show, show you that again, this intersection of the ridge here and the Farallon then breaks up into the Juan de Fuca and the, and the Cocos plate. But this, um, and also right there at 20 million years, you start to see the opening here of extension in the overriding plate. And this extension is a, is a um, it is coincident at a, from it begins around 20 or 15 million years, and it's coincident with a change in the uh, an increase in the trench retreat. Okay, so it's uh, similar to um, Japan Sea. We have an extensional basin here in the western U.S. So 20 million years is the key the key time to focus in. And now I'm going to show you now time is moving down to the south, uh, sorry, moving down towards the bottom. And this is a tectonic reconstruction by Macquarie and Wernicke. And you'll see here in the northern basin range, it really starts to um, extend towards the west. Um, more, more recently, it picks up. But all of this extension begins around 20 to 15 million years. There's an uh, important transition so one idea why, so I'll just show you the, in, the final result here is this big extensional basin across, uh, this is Nevada for scale. And you see lots of um, tilted fault blocks, uh, crustal blocks tilted throughout the, the, the main basin and range province. And so it's a big extensional uh, basin. And one idea is that uh, the width of the, of the tectonic plate that's been subducting, which prior to 20 million years um, was along all of the Western North America coast, so that the width has a fundamental um, uh, control on the, the way that the plate will subduct, either through forward plate motion or through trench retreat. So this is showing uh, a number of different tectonic uh, plates on Earth that are subducting right now. And these are some numerical models. And just want to just quickly point out the trend as a function of width is that the subducting plate motion, so uh, forward plate motion, is increasing with the width. And plates that are more narrow have a, a, sh a slower speed. However, their subduction is more uh, preferred, preferentially accommodated by trench retreat. So the, where the, the narrow slabs, the 2,000, 4,000 kilometers are preferentially subducting through trench retreat and not moving very fast. So this is the, the ratio of those essentially. The total motion um, is the, the subducting plate motion normalized by the total subducting motion. And so these numerical models um, indicate that there's a strong influence of the plate width. And so I'll just quickly go through what how this idea, if you apply it, now the models are, are very simple, oversimplified, 
and the, the exact tectonic and geologic history of North America is very complex. In fact, our, those models did not include an overriding plate. However, um, 50 million years ago, so this is a reconstruction of North America, and the Farallon plate extending all along the coast, so it's a very wide plate, so it should have a fast motion and be placing the overriding plate in compression. And that's, that's the, what's been observed is compression in the overriding plate. So this is time going uh, to the present day. And this is uh, different, this is the, uh, well we want to look at the plate motion and the subducting plate motion is going to decrease and the trench retreat is going to increase. And this is the width of the plate over time. So right now it's a maximum of 50 million years. And as we step through, um, now you see that from that animation that you saw earlier, the Farallon plate is beginning to break up, but uh, there's still quite a large margin all the way down in South America. And then at this point, the Farallon breaks up, but it isn't completely uh, evolved to the point where it's uh, two separate plates. So there's not a big change in the partitioning yet. And eventually, now 20 million years, these two things start to act as independent plates. And this is exactly the time, 20 million years, that you start to get increased extension in the basin and range. So this is shown here. And now the width has uh, made a dramatic change from what it used to be. And the plate motion has shifted to being more accommodated by trench retreat. And then finally, we just have what's the little remnant of the once mighty Farallon plate is now just the Juan de Fuca plate. Um, it's just off the coast of North America. OK. Um, uh, EarthScope is an initiative in the in, uh, United States that's uh, provided us an unprecedented amount of uh, resolution in uh, seismic imaging. And one of the major things that, that we're looking for was where the Farallon plate was. So you can see the Juan de Fuca slab here in the shallow, uh, in the shallow mantle, 100 kilometers depth. It's very visible, but as you get down to uh, even a little bit lower, it starts to um, disappear. And let's see. so these 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 are two different tomography models. And as you go uh, lower in the upper mantle, 500 kilometers depth, it's uh, it's it's there's no coherent sheet that you see as a subducted slab visible, but there's a couple little blue blobs, and they don't look very sheet-like. So these were interpreted in a variety of ways, uh, lithospheric drifts or a slab pile or something. So these were unexplained objects, and I'm showing two different tomography models to show that there's a lot of agreement between the newest tomography models. And if you look at a few others, um, this one in particular, this block here, it's, it's visible in all different tomography models using different methods and different data. So it doesn't look like uh, very much of the Farallon slab. We, we saw it. it's been subducting off the coast of North America. And um, so what, this is work primarily done by Li Jun Liu that I'm showing. That uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to go deep into the details of the, the model because we don't have much time. But it's essentially a data simulation model. We use the history of plate motions and uh, one million year increments. And we use the paleo age of the seafloor. So these are dynamic models that began about 40 million years ago and run them to the present. So we're using this as essentially a time varying uh, boundary condition. And there's a lot of um, features that you need. Going back to the uh, quote by Einstein, make, keep the model simple. Um, you know, simple enough, but not too simple. It turns out the, this is the minimum amount of simplicity that you need to get the answer. And it's fortunately a lot of things that you need to add. If you take one of these away, um, you really can't uh, succeed in matching the observations, which I'll show you. But you have to consider things like the radio viscosity profile um, through, this is the viscosity here, so we have kind of a layered uh, viscosity. and. In general, we've used viscosity, we've left it as a free parameter. So we just have been varying the profile and varying the strength of, of various features um, and not specifying a, a, a real law, but more of this 
uh, leaving them as free parameters that we systematically vary so that we can achieve a good match. Uh, so the forward model can match um, a, with the tomographic models. And we have to have weak plate boundaries. Um, this is the, the ridge out here, and this is, this is a, a, a weak hinge zone. So, and this is a, a Colorado plateau, it's a strong feature. Um, so we use sticky air as a pseudo free surface in this. And in the, so we specify with the paleo age grid the thickness of the subducting uh, slabs or the, of the plates on the surface that are getting, get, are getting subducted. And the rest is a uniform um, temperature box. So it's just uh, cold slabs sinking into a passive box, which is a uniform temperature. So there's no global scale circulation here. And there's no plumes. It's just um, there's no bottom heating in these, OK? So this is an evolution uh, starting at, um, let's see here, here's the times. At 35 million years, and the model begins. And we show where the trench is over time. And um, you can see this is where the initial trench was. So this is sort of the amount of trench retreat. And over time, that amount starts to significantly increase for right around a transition of 20 to 15 million years ago. And what happens during that, trans that transition between forward plate motion and trench retreat is that you start to um, erode away at the plate, and it actually breaks off. And then this, uh, this original part starts to sink away at, uh, independently. And then there's possibly another little break uh, there. And uh, we have to match the, the, the slab has to actually be removed from the surface dynamically um, in, in uh, perfect synchroni synchroneity, uh, perfectly synchronized with the way with the spec specified prescribed motion of the trench. Okay, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to have the, the bending of the plate exactly right for it to fall away, and you have to have the sticky air. And so this little green shape through there is kind of just a, a quick approximation of the final state for this. Um, so the, actually, this is this is our final uh, model, and this green is a average of three tomographic models, or sorry, four tomographic models. So there's the focus in on those green little segments. And these are four different tomography models that are contours for a fast velocity. And you can see that most of them have a, a break at this, at this depth. And to get this, um, the angle and the location, OK, it can be shifted over to here or to here or it can be at a different angle, or it could be at a different depth. But to get this exactly at the same place where the tomography models are observing it under North America, uh, you have to have everything, all of the viscosities, and the sink to get the right sinking trajectory. Okay. So in map view, it's uh, it actually gets worse because these these objects these. <coughs> This one here that breaks away, um, we're going down in depth. And so that, that part of the slab that broke away, as it sinks, it starts to curl around. So here it is up at 10 million years. And then you're kind of following it through in time. It's, cur it's, it's deeper now, 5 million years later. And it started to curl. So it's actually quite deformable. And, and it curls into a uh, little horseshoe-shaped feature. And then there's this other one to the north that's also um, curling around. And, uh, and so we have uh, a couple contours drawn here of, of what, these, what these shapes look like at different depths. So these contours here are different depths of the slab. Um, I'm going to skip over this, this part of the story. I'm just going to focus on this horseshoe that we see. So this is the tomography. And I actually didn't realize it had a horseshoe until the, the models. This is, um, this is the model that we've done, um, just prescribing where the plate should have gone uh, with, the, with the plate reconstruction and appropriately um, finding appropriate effective viscosities. And, and we see at the exact same depth, there's this 
horseshoe-shaped anomaly that's actually a broken off piece of the Farallon slab that has sunk to this exact location and curled around. It's a highly deformed feature. Okay, the induced mantle flow uh, that it, it induced as it sank has helped deform it into this horseshoe shape. And there's another one up here. So th this is the part. I was hoping uh, Shun could help um, tell me uh, what the answer is. Li Jun run over 200 models, and it's incredibly sensitive to viscosity, but the uh, res result is very surprising. Um, so like I said, we leave the viscosity as a free parameter, and um, here's our best fit radial viscosity profile. We need a weak asthenosphere, so these, were, these values were varied by orders of magnitude, um, and, and the final value is for the asthenosphere, it's a, uh, about 5 times 10 to the 19. The transition zone is a little bit stronger, and then we need a lower mantle that's about that strong. And the slab viscosity, our best fit model for the slab is very weak. It's only a few orders of magnitude. It's two orders of magnitude um, stronger than the asthenosphere. That's it. Not, um, not the amount that you would get from temperature um, determined viscosity, okay? If it's too strong, it, it won't deform, and it won't curl into that feature as it sinks. It'll just stay as a rigid sheet. And if it's too weak, it'll just fall away into drips and disappear entirely. Okay, it won't stay as a nice curled little segment. So, um, and in, in this I want to show that it's very sensitive. You, you end up with different shapes and different um, size features depending on what value you choose. So if you choose a, a weaker um, uh, asthenosphere, <coughs> it'll fall faster. So it affects the sinking velocity and so it ends up, ends up too deep or it ends up too shallow if you, don't, if it's too, if you have a asthenosphere viscosity too strong. And then in this case here, if the slab is too strong, it actually won't even fall away from the surface at the right, at the dynamically consistent uh, speed that you're prescribing to the trench to move at. So that's a problem. So actually, that's one of the constraints. You need the slab to be um, quite weak. And then down here, we're showing uh, the effect of the transition zone. You get completely different locations of where that slab would be if you have a different uh, strength in the transition zone. So it's a very sensitive test to um, you know, these are depth of average, but we're, we're using effective viscosities to, you know, just setting what, what would the viscosity in here be, what do I need it to be so that this slab, this subducted uh, slab ends up where the tomographically imaged slab is. And in, in map view, you can see you get very different shapes if you have this, uh, these are for all for the same depth, and if you have the slab correct, but you are um, testing the viscosity of the asthenosphere, so it'll sink um, too fast if it's too low, or not not fast enough if it's too um, too strong. And this, so the green is the correct model in all of these. And if you have the viscosity profile through the upper mantle correct, um, and you uh, get get your you trying to test for what the, what's the viscosity of the slab, here you can see that the green is the correct model. And the blue, you get a large, if it's two, if the slab is even just three times stronger, just a factor of three, you get completely uh, different shapes that don't in any way match the tomography, just a factor of three. If it's a factor of three uh, smaller, then the shapes are uh, much smaller drips and um, the, the model looks completely different from the tomography. And then this case here, we're um, showing the sensitivity on the transition zone viscosity. Again, the correct shape that, that agrees very well with the tomography, with lots of different tomography models that are all in agreement. And um, you get these, you, if it's very weak, um, then it'll, you'll get some different, uh, it'll, you'll get these broken up, but they're spaced too far apart. Okay, so if I have time, I'm gonna go into, um,
So that was, those were some, a few trials, about nine different models. Um, you know, Legion ran about 200, and we're very, two minutes? Okay. So we were pretty confident that we had a good model, and we started to uh, wonder if it, we could um, explain some of the volcanism. So there's, in the, in, so I'm just going to speed through here. The Columbia River flood basalt is a continental flood basalt. It's normally attributed to a mantle plume head, which is um, now related to this um, Yellowstone hotspot track, so the present day location. So the, it's, a, it's a sizable uh, continental flood basalt, and it has an interesting eruption history, which sort of started um, at Steens and then moved to the north, as you can see, over time. Uh, these volcanic units are getting in place um, and between 16 and 15 million years. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different models for how it... Oh, I might have skipped over... No? There's a lot of different models, so we, we do think it's a plume. And I was going to focus in on um, this hinge here. At, at that time, between uh, 20 and 15 million years during that transition period, when this plate starts to break away, the slab starts to break away, and that hinge is starting to erode, it's actually, we started to look at this in more detail, and uh, this is an isosurface here, so here's the plate on the surface, and the other plate's moving away, and here's the slab, so this is the hinge, and um, there's the trench, and the, and the depth, uh, 70 kilometers, where the slab would be, and so this hole starts to open up, and this tear starts to propagate, but at the 16 million years, it, 16.8, which is the exact same time the eruption of Steens Mountain. Uh, if you project this hole up to the surface, that's the exact place that that continental flood basalt begins. And it starts to propagate um, to the north and south, which is observed propagation um, for dike swarms in this, um, in this continental flood basalt sequence. And then finally moves up to here to these large dike swarms. And eventually, um, there's a giant tear in the slab, which is a new mechanism for developing a continental flood basalt. So this is uh, another evidence that the slab is a lot weaker than what um, the normal temperature determined viscosity would say it is. So this, this agreement between where the slab tears that, we, that is just completely emergent from these models that agree very well, they're well constrained by, uh, have good agreement with tomography images, and where this, uh, the eruption history of the Columbia River basalt. So, I'm just going to, yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My question is, uh, uh, that region is quite different in the history of Eastern Asia. And one quite different thing is uh, uh, there was no fall and the uh, uh, Rio Grande is just connected. It's a very long zone as well was present. And uh, North America was dated all the way to the way 3,000 kilometers after the birth of the So that. Uh, Therefore, of course, you know, uh, that slab must be strongly affected by zone aquarium, not only by scope like uh, Yellowstone, uh, Newberry, Osborne. So the surface expression we know that from Rio Grande to all the way to Arctic Ocean, by numbers of southern or more than southern of mantle generals brought by uh, small syndicon, uh, syndicon bomb -like. So that, that my question uh, to you is that that kind of zone aquarium may have strongly uh, affected and modified subducted structure. What, what do you think of that? 
at the different uh, style of, uh, you know, stuff. Okay, Wait, well, our, our model did not right. include any plumes or any upwelling. Yeah. It's just a passive box. And coal things that we have, uh, that, are, that are known from plate reconstructions are, are sinking under gravity in a, in a passive box. That's the simplest model that we can make. And we are in very strong agreement with tomography. So I don't oh, see a purpose, purpose in adding extra features if we're already explaining the data. No, no. my question is that you are saying this, and what do you solve? What do you solve? I, well, yeah, uh, the, if, if you have plumes in the area, in the neighborhood, well, the conduits know. are very weak, and, and there's, they're weaker than the background mantle that is, is getting pushed out of the way by the, you know, the slabs or the buoyant features that are the drivers in the system. So um, if there's, there's passive upwelling, that's, that's okay. If, if I don't see uh, that active upwelling has a large role in it. But I do think that Yellowstone is probably yeah, some kind of that boom. Thing or rope, OK, so. please, let's go to the next question, because uh, we are a bit late. So there was Shun, I think. Uh, yeah, very simple question. Uh, your slug is not this uh, unbelievably low. And uh, how do you explain this? No, I, how do you explain it? I don't, I don't know. We're just trying to find the, the, the values that, that something is wrong. Yeah, because do you have any estimate of slab temperature, like a, from seismic velocity or something? I mean, we're we're just leaving viscosity as a free parameter and yeah. and finding the viscosity that helps the model agree yeah. with the tomography. So I don't know. The Earth is the one that's wrong. Yeah, we should say also that, the, I mean, your, your model, you have a cost of viscosity of the slab, so it's sort of an average. No, 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 it's, it's, there's temperature dependence. We just clip it very early. Okay, so, so there's activation there's, volume. There's, there's activation volume, but we're clipping it. We're, we're just limiting the maximum that it can reach. Otherwise, it's not deformable enough, and it can't evolve into these shapes that are observed like that. Horseshoe shape will not happen if the slab is too strong. Okay. Um, last question. I have a couple questions. Yeah. I was really interested to talk. Um, a couple of things is I wouldn't necessarily say that the Earth is wrong because these are non-unique. You can arrive at the match data with a variety of different approaches. One thing with the temperature-dependent viscosities is that, um, well, in your models, the, the slab viscosity along the entire length of the slab is, is fixed to one value. Is that right? And you just no. It, so no, but it's, if you have temperature, if you have a temperature dependence in there, it quickly reaches the maximum that you've you've limited it to. Oh, in, in the models that you have. Okay, so do you have um, weakening? Like, do you guys have a nonlinear rheology in there where there's a strain rate dependence in the viscosity structure? No, we have effective viscosities. We've not specified rheological laws. We've specified effective viscosities because we're trying to match the tomography. Okay, so when in models that actually use the, um, the, the rheology laws that are based on experimental work, um, they show that along the length of the slab, you get variations in the strength by several orders of magnitude, for example, in the hinge where you have that sort of, like, weakening. And in addition, you have, um, in the mantle surrounding the slab, locally less viscous support. So you could get viscosities with an onion linear rheology, like down to 10 to the 19, 10 to the 18, around the slab that then would, would strengthen um, elsewhere. So, um, but that doesn't I mean, help you with 500 kilometers depth. So. Well, I mean, well, what would affect, well, maybe maybe not, but I mean, in the upper hole, in the upper mantle, you, ha you were yeah, having... These things are deforming all through the upper mantle, but it's not just the hinge where they're under high stress. Right, it's, right. It's, but it's, it's, their, it's the stress of the induced mantle flow that's able to deform the slabs. That's how weak they have to be. Right, so could another mechanism for weakening possibly be the effect of the heat from the plume? This is the entire. This is the entire Farallon plate. It's just the plume would be quite localized. The, per, you know, there's the, the, there's no reason to invoke a, a plume heating. Uh, it would be a very heterogeneous, you know, okay. way of heating. So there's lots of weakening mechanisms. We have we have to figure out what the weakening weakening mechanism is that makes slabs very weak. Yes. Okay. Last only last question, and then we proceed. To oh. Next slide. Okay. So. Dave, just last, uh, last, last question. Uh, when you compare um, your model with, uh, with the tomography, 
Uh, tomography showed uh, a lot of heterogeneities that have more or less the same amplitude of the signal that you are looking for. Um, I was wondering, but well, first, what is your interpretation of this kind of heterogeneity? Second, uh, is it possible to start from this heterogeneity, basically from a tomographic model, and make it kind of time reverse yeah. to, to arrive to, to try to explain this kind of heterogeneity? Yeah, Alijun spent a lot of time trying to, um, because he's one of the world experts in, in effectively doing an adjoint model, starting with the tomography model, running it backwards. Um, there, the nature of the, um, there's a lot of nonlinearities that are difficult to account for in running it backwards, so we finally just said, let's just do it the old-fashioned way and run lots of forward models. Um, so we kind of had to abandon that approach, um, even though he's one of the best people that could do it. It, it was um, it's just too many uh, nonlinearities that make it difficult to, to to move it back because you have because you have uh, you can't unbend slabs in the right direction when you move them back. They just want to float straight up due to gravity, right? So there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. You, have, you have a personal limitation about what's this heterogeneous. Uh, well, if, if they're fast and they're generally um, colored blue, then they're probably slabs. That's, okay, yeah. let's proceed. We can discuss this later. I mean, there will be a discussion.